Charles, thank you so much. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation for your book, Sacred Economics. That book has transformed the way that I understand monetary systems, debt and economics. You start your book by saying that since at least the time of Jesus, since Jesus cast the money lenders out of, of the temple, we have tended to view money as profane rather than sacred. Now, not all of us uh, uh, in this uh, co conference will understand how money actually works. So maybe if you could begin by explaining how money operates, uh, particularly what, uh, like a god, and how our monetized life a, prof a, a, a profane one rather than sacred. <clears throat> okay, that's a pretty big question. Um, I mean, most people have a, a, an intuition or even an instinct that there's something profane about money, something that conflicts with human values. Um, it's hard to put your finger on it exactly what it is about money, because ultimately money is simply a way to coordinate human labor and creativity and to facilitate the meeting of gifts and needs. There should be nothing fundamentally bad about I have something that you need and you don't have anything I need right now. So let me give you money instead. Uh, you, you could even see it as a token of my gratitude. And now somebody else knows that I've done a, a service to you or to society. And so I give them the money and they do something for me. Like, it seems like there should be nothing wrong with it. Right. So why does it seem to be a force for evil rather than good in the world? That was the motivating question of sacred economics, because like many people, when I try to understand what's wrong in the world, I would often come to come you come down to money, like somebody is making money, <clears throat> excuse me, making money from exploitation, extraction, ecocide, and so forth. Yeah, so as for money being like a god, um, I cited some research by a uh, historian, uh, I think his name was Richard Seaford, right. who went back to ancient Greece and described the effect. He said that it was the first um, fully monetized society or heavily monetized society and that the way that money worked in that society fed a lot of our intuitions about about not just money but about human nature and even about spirituality so like for example the idea that uh, all things return to one thing and and that there or that there is uh, a, a ever present force all that is everywhere that governs life uh, or that there is a universal end that all people seek in life or that all things can be reduced to one thing so he so one of the things that i i describe is money starting as a universal means in a, in a monetized society, you don't need to be able to build a house or grow food or even cook food or have skill at all as long as you have money. So it's a universal means. Because it's universal means, it therefore becomes a universal end. And and so, so because you think, well, if I only have money, then I have everything. So it becomes an end in and of itself kind of replacing uh, religious teachings where the universal means maybe was devotion to God and the universal end would be um, uh, enlightenment or um, preparation for heaven or something like that or heaven. Yeah, so money kind of, it's not just that it replaced those things, but it also informed our intuitions about those things. Right. Well, maybe I'll just pause there and, and you can okay. follow up. So you, you also speak about um, um, kind of the the way that money operates is almost like a religion today because it has its own priesthood and it's, you know, the, the, the banking system being the temples, if you like. Like it's become the, the ultimate, uh, um, the, 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 that which we seek in the ultimate in our lives. It's very much like magic, too. You know, I, I have this. So I, you know, I go to this to the supermarket and I load up my cart with all kinds of food. And then I have to pass through a, uh, a, a little 
station where I must perform a ritual. And the ritual consists of taking a, a uh, sacred chit, you know, a little talisman, and, and performing this action. I stick it into a, a, a little receptacle. And if the ritual <clears throat> is successful, then I am allowed to depart with all of these groceries. And what makes the ritual successful? Well, there's other rituals behind it that are administered by a priesthood, a financial priesthood. You know, what is it about, th this was going back to ancient Greece, you know, this coins took on a value beyond the value of, of the precious metals within them. In fact, even in Greek and Roman times, not all coins were made of gold or silver. They made them out of all kinds of things. Uh, but even if they were made of gold or silver, they were more valuable than the equivalent amount of bullion. So people say, well, if the value is not in the thing itself, there must be some extra material element to it that gives it value beyond, beyond its material value. What is this thing? Oh, that's spirit. And so this was part of the dematerialization of spirit and the separation of divinity from materiality, which like, you know, I know you're a reverend, um, so I'm not sure what your theological views on this are, but this is certainly, you know, some people might say, well, yeah, primitive people were primitive in their religion too, and they were pantheistic, and they thought that matter itself was sacred rather than being infused with sacredness by an external creator. Um, and we've, you know, we Western people have risen above that um, benighted primitive view. Uh, but we could also say that um, we have departed in many ways from an embodied material spirituality. Um, which allows us this departure from holding the world sacred and instead locating sacredness in something extra material that gives us license to destroy the material world and treat it as if it were not sacred, as if it were profane. And so money, as it is associated with the material world and is the key symbolic instrument for our manipulation of that world, it takes on the profanity that we assign to materiality. Right. Okay. And one of the reasons why we, we, we treat nature as if it's a commodity, because it's, it's not alive anymore in, in, our, our, in our Western mindset. Yeah. And it's, so that's one, one thing is that the mindset disposes us to see nature as a commodity, but it's also the commodification of nature. Right. But let, let me come to um, your, your chapter two, which is entitled The Illusion of Scarcity. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, one of the reasons that I'm, I'm, I'm having this interview with this is because some people have said to me, we don't understand how debt actually operates. So why is debt such a big problem? So I said, OK, I'll get Charles to answer that question. The illusion is scarcity, you state the following. It is said that money, or at least the love of it, is the root of all evil. But why should it be, after all, as you said to us, the purpose of money at its most basic is to facilitate exchange, to connect human gift with human needs? And so what power, what monstrous perversion has turned money into the very opposite as it's an agent of scarcity, quote unquote. So can you explain how the money as we perceive it today, at any rate, or we use it today, imposes an artificial scarcity on what I would call God's abundance? Because of the way money is created, which is through interest bearing debt. Anytime, and this is actually starting to change, um, but... Normally, uh, a bank will make a loan uh, and thereby put money into the economy. Uh, it starts at the central bank level and gets the money into the banking system. And then through lending, it gets into the economy. And so every time this happens, an equivalent amount of debt is created. So you take out a loan. Now, all of a sudden, you have a million euro or whatever in your bank account. And you owe the bank now maybe 2 million euro. Uh, if it's a 7% interest rate over 10 years, whatever. You owe the bank more than the bank gave you. Because all money is created this way, there's always more debt than there is money. Therefore, there, we're always in competition for never enough of it. There's always scarcity and it's built into the system. The only way that, that we can avoid mass bankruptcies when these debts come due is for even more money to be created to keep up with the 
with the debts, and that creates even more debt. So we're plunged headlong into a endless competition for for money, and and to to win that competition, we have to participate in the creation of new goods and services. And that may not be a bad thing. Um, it's, it, but, but we have to recognize that in the current system, growth, the necessity for growth is built into it and scarcity is built into it. And that means that things that are normally not scarce become scarce when they become monetized. Uh, and and to, to, to become monetized, they have to become propertized first. They have to be made into property. So this, we see this happening in the realm of intellectual property, which fundamentally doesn't have to be scarce. Like if I, if I create a song or a book, um, I could distribute it for free, basically. I mean, there's some initial cost, but each copy beyond the first copy costs me almost nothing. So in order to make money off it, I have to make it artificially scarce by putting it behind a paywall, digital rights management, and so forth. And so here's a perfect example of fundamental abundance that through its association with the money system is made artificially scarce. And the same thing has actually happened to the material world, where we have um, artificial scarcity of everything that human beings need. It's not that we have an unlimited amount of everything. It's not that everybody in the world could have a giant diamond ring or something like that. But the basics of life, food, shelter, clothing, and community, health, love, like all of these things, um, we, we see tremendous, obscene waste side by side with crying poverty. Half the food in the world is wasted. And I don't know, one in five, one in six people go hungry. I, I had just read your book and I went to a, a Christian music festival called Greenbelt here in the UK. And I saw your, this artificial scarcity in operation. The, 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 the car park was quite far away to where the, the tents needed to be set. And the, the organizers had put on uh, golf carts. Uh, and there were plenty of them, up and down, up and down, up and down. But you had to pay £10 or whatever it was to, to have a ride. And so we were seeing these old people who clearly couldn't afford it. And these families with children carrying heavy things walking along the side of the road with these half empty cars with those who could afford it in it going up and yeah. down up that's artificial scarcity because of the association with the monetary system but what was interesting is nobody seemed to think that that was a problem for a, as christians you would think the, the, the first thing you want to do is pick up those old people and those children you know yeah. not not it didn't even cross our minds and and it, we, we have been so, so socialized into thinking that this artificial scarcity is normal, that we, it's, I think it's difficult for us to see it sometimes. Yeah, and another aspect of that is um, the, the uh, banishment of religion to the realm of the soul, uh, which draws on the idea that religion is this private thing that doesn't actually affect your material political life. So therefore it can be sequestered off into a separate realm and so part of that is is you know you could be this whole festival about christianity and what is happening materially doesn't matter that much because that's you know an economic question that's not a spiritual question yeah 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 I mean, I mean, there are a bunch of post-colonial studies now, readings of scripture that are changed fundamentally about, um, you know, de de deconstructing the debt-based economic system. So the good news is we're starting to see this slowly anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, chapter, in chapter six, you delve into the economics of usury uh, and you show us how an interest-based monetary system forces perpetual growth that you, you say drives the relentless conversion of life into money Completing the vicious circle, the more life we convert into money, the more we need money to live. Mm -hmm. Usury, not money, is the proverbial root of all evil. And, and I think it's in that chapter that you, you, you say one of the most beautiful lines in the book is where um, uh, all, the, not even one um, meadow, not even one forest will be left over because everything has to be converted into money. Uh, could you ex 
Could you explain how interest on debt operates and how it leads to this beautiful phrase you give, the strip mining of the commons? Yeah. So, so going back to the, the money creation process. So say I'm a bank and I, and I have money to lend. Who am I going to lend it to? I'm going to lend it to somebody, um, a firm, maybe a corporation or a business person who has a business plan that they can demonstrate to me will earn them more money than I'm giving them. So they'll, they'll be able to pay me back. Yeah. So if their business plan involves restoring an ecosystem and not making any money from that, even if I want to support that, I can't because they're not going to be able to pay back the loan. So economic growth is essentially to find some new expansion of the realm of goods and services. So it could be to cut down a forest and sell the lumber, or it could be to replace a human function with a paid service. So we see in my lifetime, some of the biggest economic growth areas have been um, food preparation, childcare, um, and um, if, if, for lack of a better word, culture, the, the, uh, and, and video games, things like that, that replace functions that were once not monetized. People cooked for each other, they helped out their neighbors, um, lawn care services, huge growth industry. People used to mow their own lawn. And if the old lady down the street couldn't do it, you'd help her out. Uh, so anything that you find that people can do for each other, that's a business opportunity. You could sell it to them. And, and, and so that's what has been happening until we get to a point where there's nothing left, no community left. People are paying for everything now, even uh, friendship or wise advice or what was once, or dispute mediation used to happen informally in community uh, or in uh, an extended family. And, and, and now we hire a lawyer instead, or we call the cops. How much longer can we continue? But in, in, in the years since I've written the book, I've decided that that's not quite the right question. It's not how long can we continue until we're forced to change, mm. but it is what kind of world do we want to live in? Do we want to continue? And if we don't, how can we make a different choice? What has to change inside of us to make a different choice? Okay, well, let's turn to some potential solutions then. Um, in Sacred Economics, you show how our economic system rests on uh, a foundation of the story of separation, anonymity, depersonalization, polarization of wealth, endless growth, ecological despoliation, social turmoil and irremediable crisis uh, irremediable how oh, i get that word crisis uh, built into our economic system so so deeply that nothing less than the transformation of the defining story of the people will heal it so could you tell us a little bit more about what this new story of the people might be and why we need it before we begin to think about solutions yeah i mean i think that the new I, I like to call it a new and ancient story because it's not really new. Um, it generates different kinds of solutions uh, or even different questions. Um, and it also comes from a different system. The, sy the system creates the story and the story creates the system. So we're, so I wouldn't necessarily say that first we have to have a new story before we can make any progress on a new system, okay. but it is an integral part of the transition that we are that is underway, uh, so the story that I speak about uh, using the Buddhist term um, interbeing basically says that we are not, as we've been told, separate individuals. Um, however, you conceive that um, flesh robots programmed by our DNA to maximize self-interest, or skin encapsulated souls or bubbles of psychology floating around. We're not any of these things. We are interdependent, interconnected, and even interexistent. My being participates in your being. And the being of the world 
is part of my being and everything that happens in the world happens to me on some level. Everything that I do, I'm doing to myself. You can frame that most easily in Eastern religions through, through karma, but I believe you can frame it in Western religion too, that any harm you cause does damage to your soul. Even if you can insulate yourself from any predictable effect, if you bomb and exploit everybody everywhere, the, the, the mind of separation says, I can protect myself from any consequence. If I institute a comprehensive surveillance system and fill the sky with drones to kill anybody who's going to try to get revenge, then I can, I can shield myself from the negative effects of what I do to the world. Uh, and, and I would say that that perception is one of the perceptions of a story of separation. So a story of interbeing, um, whether you frame it in Eastern or Western theological terms, it says that there is no escape because we're not separate. As we inhabit that story more deeply, the economic system that we're living in becomes intolerable because it enforces separation. It is the enemy of our desire to um, live in the gift. Um, it tells us the opposite of what we know to be true. It makes it seem as if we are separate competing beings. It makes it seem as if what happens to you has no bearing on what happens to me. In fact, your misfortune can be my good fortune. I get the job and you don't. I get the loan and you don't. I get the raise and you don't. Because you're separate from me, um, we're in competition. And, and so if, if the system is set up to necessitate competition, then it seems true that we are separate. So the system is out of sync with the story that we are moving into. And I think that as our consciousness changes, as we step more deeply into a story of interbeing, we will feel more and more alienated from the economic system that we have. It'll seem more and more wrong and we will become more um, willing to entertain um, changes, solutions that are at home in a, in a new story. I think um, you are show very convincingly that the money, modern money transactions tend to be closed systems, leaving no room for obligation. Uh, and but you talk about a gift, a, a gift, a gift exchange. Um, maybe I don't want to use the word transaction. A gift exchange as an open-ended system, uh, and it, it creates this ongoing tie between the participants. Mm -hmm. um, and you say that another way of looking at the gift, uh, the gift itself partakes of the giver. Something of the of the of the giver is actually in that gift when we give it. We give something of ourselves. Do you want to tell us maybe how this understanding of guest exchange might offer us a, a clue to an alternative um, uh, uh, basis uh, t to something like debt? One of the features of a money economy is that it's alienating. Mm. It's alienating both through the conversion of the world into standardized commodities and through the conversion of people into standardized consumers and producers. Um, and as you said, through the, the um, replacement of relationships with transactions. So in a financial transaction, I go to the store, I buy something, I get the loaf of bread, you get the money and we're done. I don't owe you anything, you don't owe me anything. We right. have no ongoing relationship. The same is true of barter, actually. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of gift exchange. Oh. A, a, a real gift culture is not about exchange. Okay. Like I might be in a gift culture, I might be the grandfather and I'm giving certain kinds of gifts to people and I'm receiving other kinds of gifts from other people. They may not even be one and the same person. But every time that I receive a gift, that puts me in debt to the community that I cannot. So a community is actually a group of people who are all hopelessly in debt to each other. But but not monetized debt, um, uh, oblig obligation debt, as it were. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just. To... I mean, it could be monetized debt, but but yeah. In general, if if I give you a gift and you don't give me something back right away, then you owe me something. Yes. Like we have 
Or maybe you don't owe it to me, maybe you owe it to the community. You've received generosity and you feel gratitude as a result. So gratitude is the flip side of obligation. And you can't easily distinguish gratitude and obligation. Okay. Gratitude puts you in a, in a state of obligation. It, and obligation really means a tie. To, to put a tie on something, lig, li, ligate, right? Um, so it means to tie people together. And isn't that what we want? To become more tied, to become more uh, embedded in the world, to, to become more alive, you know? Um, not to, to drift off into this illusory paradise of independence where you don't need anybody, you don't, you're not related to anybody, I'm fine without you. I'm fine without the world. That's a pretty lonely place. Mm -hmm. People everywhere in the developed world are yearning to restore community. But you can't have community without dependency, without, um, without obligation, without, without gift. Yeah, the very thing that we seek, we also are afraid of. We're afraid to be connected in this world. Because so, as you said, so often that what that actually means now is debt, um, debt to entities that are not really part of our community, but mm -hmm. and that have no human connection to us. They're they're actually they actually are seeking to maximize their self interest. That's the way that the system works, mm -hmm. and it's not even that they're malevolent. You know, no, no, no. they they yeah. are St structural. <laughs> Yeah. It's structural, yeah. and to them, you are just a consumer, a debtor. Yeah. Um, you are a, an accounting entry. You make a, a correlation uh, in Chapter 12 between our sense of self and money. Uh, and you say, as the word mine implies, we see money almost as, as an extension of ourselves, which is why we feel ripped off when something, some of our money is taken from us. And associating our self with something that persists and refuses to age and die uh, perpetuates this illusion of our own permanence. Uh, and you say it's no accident uh, that the first highly monetized society, which is ancient Greece, around about 600 BC, was also the birthplace of the modern concept of the individual. And I think you've basically explained a little bit about how the self needs to almost be broken up uh, into, into something that is uh, far more relational. I would say it has to dilate, you know, uh, to expand and to soften its borders. Right, right. Yeah. And one of the solutions you offered was uh, something that, and, and you pointed me to him, Bernard Littiesch. I, I think he actually passed away earlier this year, sadly. He did, yes. Um, but, and, you, and you speak about uh, creating currencies that actually are negative interest, script currencies. Uh, and how, how would this work? And how would this affect our sense of self? And perhaps... How would this protect an ancient forest? Yeah. Um, so basically, uh, influenced by Bernard Lietera, who turned me on to uh, uh, early 20th century economist named Silvio Gassel. Gassel. Like I did all this research on this idea that, that if, if usury is the root of all evil, then what happens if you reverse it? Right. What happens if, if your bank account, instead of growing over time, it shrinks uh, because money decays somehow, um, like the rest of like the rest of nature, <laughs> like nature. Yeah, right. Uh, so you can't. It doesn't lend itself to the illusion of permanence anymore. I did the research. There wasn't at the time I wrote the book. It was ten years ago. There wasn't that much literature on negative interest economics. I pretty much read everything that there was. Right. Now there's a lot more because negative interest seems to be creeping up on us simply because of the end of growth. Economic growth rates have been slowing down uh, for many decades. And, and in order for central bank policy to work, um, you have to be able to lower interest rates below the essentially the average return on investment. Uh, otherwise, People would rather hold on to their money than invest it in the real economy. So interest rates have to be low enough that you would happily lend it out um, and get it into the economy. Well, if, if the overall growth rate is, is close to zero, 
then the interest rates have to be close to zero or even below zero for that to happen. Um, and every time that central banks try to normalize interest rates and, and raise them again, then the markets mm. balk mm. And, and they quickly retreat. So it's happening anyway. Mm. Uh, and basically what it means, and, and you know, what I advocate in the book is a much steeper negative interest rate than what we're seeing today. Uh, that would require some kind of, so it's really counterintuitive, you know, um, but it would require some, some mechanism for cash, like physical currency to gradually uh, expire. So that if you held on to your hundred pound banknote for five years, maybe be, only be worth 80 pounds mm. when you try to spend it or when you exchange it for a new one. It, it's really, um, unless somebody is mathematically inclined or, or has, you know, has a good understanding of monetary policy and economics, it's hard for me to like really give the big picture. Okay. But basically, the metaphor that I like to use is imagine that, that I have a thousand loaves of bread and forget me being altruistic, like I'm, I'm greedy, I, I am selfish. I have a thousand loaves of bread and there's a lot of people out there who need bread and there's no money, okay? Bread is money. So in that situation, it is not to my advantage to hold on to the bread because it's gonna go stale. Each day, that bread gets less valuable. Hmm. It's to my advantage to give every single person out there a loaf of bread and say, when you, when I need bread, then I'll ask you to pay me back a loaf of fresh bread. And essentially, it is to my advantage to lend at zero interest. Yep. I don't have the leverage because everybody knows that if I hold on to it, then it's going to go going to go bad. Right. So, so the basic idea is let's make money like bread, so that the owners of money have less of an advantage. Unlike today, where the owners of money have a tremendous advantage over the people who are producing goods, who have their labor, because your labor disappears every day. You know, the decay rate of labor of your time is 100%. Let's make money like bread. Let's make it decay like everything else in nature. Let's make economy no longer an exception to ecology. Let's value the future as much as we value the present. If in a positive interest system, you'd rather have a million dollars now than a um, hundred thousand a year for 10 years. Hmm. The money's more about because then you could have, you can make interest on it. Yeah. But in a negative interest system, you'd rather have a hundred thousand a year for 10 years. Yes. You'd rather have a forest um, earn sustainable revenue of a hundred thousand a year, then cut it all down and cover up the parking lot. Right. So, so it, it reverses this, this short term thinking. Right. right. Yeah. Thank you. We, the, the way that we're framing this conference on debt is within uh, the Council for World Missions Theology as mission in the context of empire. They're saying that God's mission always takes place in the context of systems of domination. So, for example, the, the prophets were, were, were speaking to um, um, systems of domination. Moses led the people, the Hebrew, out of, uh, out of domination, systems of domination. And in the desert, they were learning a new way, a new economy, if you like. That, that, that Moses did not want that generation to to transport this, these systems of domination into the promised land. Part of what uh, the Council for World Mission has found is that these systems tend to colonize our minds. They they shape our consciousness and they curtail our ability to see alternatives. Uh, Jesus in this reading calls us to come out, the, the, the root word of the ecclesia is to actually come out of these systems, mm. come out of these systems into this new radical reality of equality and justice. Um, and I think this, fr this framing of Jesus's mission uh, resonates very nicely, I think, with your phrase, the more beautiful world our heart tell us is possible. Can you tell us a little bit about what this world will look like that is waiting to be birthed? You know, I, I get certain visions of it, premonitions. I, I hardly dare to describe it for several reasons. Uh, one is that any description that I give falls short of what's possible. 
Um, secondly, any description I give is going to carry with it the limitations of my own life experience. Instead, I would rather remind people of their vision of it that has been granted through special experiences. You know, maybe if you've ever experienced a great healing or forgiveness or generosity or um, been in a situation where people really put down their ego and are cooperating for real um, or are allowing themselves to be fully seen. And, and these moments I understand as the um, outreach of the future into the present, like a future revealing a little piece of itself. And when I experience something like that, I think, what would the world be like built upon this? What would a world be like if this were normal? These are the glimpses of the, of, of the future that is possible, that our hearts know is possible, that our minds doubt because they say, how are we going to get there? Uh, and I don't have a plan to get there, even though sacred economics, I describe a lot of public policies and personal shifts that are part of a movement, I believe, to a more beautiful world. But I think probably every single thing in there will eventually be discarded as a mistake. Um, and I think we're, we're going to have to make a lot of mistakes in order to reach the promised land, which after all is only a few hundred miles from Egypt, <laughs> um, but it took 40 years, to get, 40 years to get there. They had to get lost before they could find it. And they had to lose the habits of slavery before yeah. they could find it. They had to make the missteps that were governed by their habituation to slavery. And that is our situation right now where yeah. we are habituated to slavery to the, or let's say servitude, to the money system, to the society built around it, to the paradigm of, of separation, to the experience of being a separate self in, the, in a world of other, to the um, reduction of the material world to something profane. Like all of these habits, as you say, rest deeply within our minds. So our solutions that we, that we attempt to escape this prison very often carry the assumptions of the prison yeah. and they don't get us very far yeah. um, but they are part of the humiliation that is necessary for us to achieve the humility that is necessary for for, for us to receive the actual solutions that's how it's, that, that's how I, I see the transition happening. Uh, we're, we're in the face of a tremendous unknown, at the brink of an unknown. Mm -hmm.